All right, you guys, welcome back to the next lesson in this series here covering blood products. In this lesson, we're actually gonna be taking a look at a quick review over some important information related to the different blood types. I'll start things off with a review of some of the basic blood types and then the concepts related to those, and then cover some important points as they relate to critical care, including some of our potential complications. So let's go ahead and dive into blood types. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. Again, my name is Eddie Watson, and my goal with this YouTube channel is to try and give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by taking these complex critical care subjects and breaking them down, making them easy to understand. I really hope that I'm able to do just that for you guys. And if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. Make sure you guys hit that bell icon and select all notifications. That way you'll never miss out when I release a new lesson. Also, at the end of this lesson, make sure you head over to icuadvantage.com or follow the link down in the lesson description to take the quiz on this particular lesson. You can test your knowledge as well as be entered into weekly prizes for gift cards. All right, so in the last lesson, we talked about the different blood products that we often use in the ICU. I felt it was important to start there so that you'd have an understanding of what these different components were and why we'd be using them. One thing that kept coming up was the importance of blood compatibility in most of the situations. Because of this, I did want to review the topic and talk about some of the applications of this within critical care and emergent situations. So we're going to start off talking about the basics of blood types. Now, in order to understand why blood types matter, let's do a super quick review of what they actually mean. And to do so, we have to talk about our antigens and antibodies. Now, to start, on the surface of red blood cells, there are specific blood group antigens. The two most important ones are going to be our ABO and our RHD antigens. Now, there are actually 36 others, and while they do pose risk, they are relatively low for our patient. So when we are cross-matching, we're actually checking against a group of these potentially clinically significant antibodies. Now for our ABO antigen, there can either be the A type, B type, AB type, or the none type, which is what we refer to as O. And then for our RHD, it's either there positive or it's not negative. Now, obviously our bodies aren't going to make antibodies against our own antigens that we have, but if there is an exposure to an unknown antigen, the immune system will actually make the antibodies against this foreign antigen. Now, for the ABO antigens, we're actually commonly exposed to this as an infant thanks to a certain bacteria, and thus we develop the antibodies for the ABO antigens without any initial exposure. For the others, though, these do require an exposure to that blood antigen typically before we build up those antibodies. Now, if an exposure does happen after the antibodies are made, then this is where the trouble can come from. And then for reference, the antibodies that we have for our ABO for patients who are A blood type, they're going to have B antibodies. For patients who are B blood type, they're going to have A antibodies. If they're the AB blood type, then they actually don't have any antibodies. And if they're the O blood type, then they actually are going to have both A and B antibodies. And then for RHD, obviously if they're positive, they're not going to have the antibodies. If they're negative RHD, then this is where we're going to see that D antibody. And so we've got to actually talk about the compatibility here. As a result of this antigen antibody reaction, there are interactions with different blood types that can lead to some serious consequences, which I am going to talk about more in just a minute here. Now, in order to understand what blood type someone can receive, we have to think about what antibody they might have based on what their blood type is. So for example, someone who's A positive is going to have antibodies for B only, and they're not going to have the RHD antibodies. And so therefore, they couldn't receive any B blood, and this is going to include AB donors. They would be okay with getting either A blood or O blood. And then because they're positive RHD, they don't have those antibodies, so they could receive both positive and negative blood, and they're not going to have those antibodies to work against that. Now, we can really summarize all this information in a table and talk about some of the key points here. First off, the first choice is always going to be for typed and cross-matched blood for our patient. 
Now from there, if we either don't know what that is or it's not rapidly available, the second choice is almost always O negative. One slight variation to this is if we have a patient who's AB, then we can actually go to giving them either A or B blood before we go to an O blood type. And so as you can see, our O blood types, and more specifically O negative, is compatible with any other blood type, and that's why we refer to this as the universal donor. Now, unfortunately, the universal donor actually has all of the antibodies, so they can actually only receive O negative blood. And then on the flip side, when it comes to giving patients plasma, again, we want to give them the preferred type that they are. But if we're not able to give them that, then AB is actually going to be our universal donor here. And specifically, we're going to be talking about AB positive. And so hopefully this kind of makes sense. If you think about the plasma of a patient who's AB positive, they're not going to make antibodies against their own blood type. So they're not going to have A, they're not going to have B antibodies, and they're not going to have RHD antibodies. So AB positive blood has no antibodies in it, therefore it's compatible with any other red blood cells of a person who's to receive that plasma. All right, so kind of along the same lines, I do want to talk a little bit more about our O blood types when it comes to our packed red blood cells. So again, like I mentioned, O negative is considered the universal donor, but only about 7% of the population is actually O negative. Given the need for tens and sometimes even 100 plus units to some patients, such as bleeding traumas, this makes it really in high demand and the first to run out in a shortage. Now here specifically, these red cells have no antigens, so they don't have any ABO antigens on the blood, and they don't have, since they're negative, they don't have the RHD antigen. So it doesn't matter if the recipient has any antibodies because it's not going to attack this blood because it does not have any antigens. Now, unfortunately, like I mentioned about the particular patient with O negative blood, that they're actually going to have all of the antibodies themselves, and therefore they can only receive O negative blood. In emergent situations where the patient's blood type is not known, then O negative is going to be our most commonly used blood here. Now, O positive is actually the most commonly given blood. So here, 38% of the population is actually O positive, and thus this makes it the most common blood out there. Also, over 80% of the population is RHD positive, and so thus they don't have the anti-D antibodies, and so if you're an A positive person, you can receive O positive blood. So O positive is going to be universally compatible with all RHD positive patients. Now, an interesting caveat that's going to be important to us in critical care is going to be in massive transfusion situations where our patients are having a massive exsanguination. So here, think of your traumas, uh, your GI bleeds, things like that. Here, O positive has been shown to be beneficial. They've found that in these situations, the risk of transfusion reaction is much lower because we're just going through so much blood and really the patient doesn't have much of their own plasma left. And so this actually makes O positive pretty critical in trauma and these massive transfusion situations. So just in case you guys come across that where you get O positive blood, you might be wondering why you're getting O positive versus O negative. Hopefully this helps that to make sense. All right, and so the next thing that I want to talk about is some of our transfusion complications. Given the issues with the compatibilities and really general immune reactions, there are certain complications that can arise from giving blood and other blood products. And so the first of these that I'm going to talk about is going to be our hemolytic reactions. Now, this is a result of that antigen-antibody reaction with the ABO incompatible blood types. Here, the antibodies are going to bind the antigen on the red blood cells and then activate the complement system, leading to the lysis of these blood cells within the vasculature. Now, signs and symptoms that you would see with this are going to be fever, shortness of breath, hypotension, and chest and back pain. Now, this is a very serious complication that could potentially lead to death in our patient. So, if this is happening, you need to immediately stop the transfusion and contact the provider. And at this point, it's going to be supportive treatment and really trying to support their hemodynamics. All right, the next reaction that I want to talk about is going to be our hypersensitivity reactions or what we would refer to as an anaphylaxis reaction. So this is going to result from an allergic reaction to the plasma proteins. So this reaction may be delayed by up to 30 minutes. And so this is really why we transfuse slowly over the first 15 to 30 minutes in those non-emergent situations. 
So signs and symptoms that we would expect to see here would be things like hives, wheezing, shortness of breath, and hypotension. Once again, we do want to stop the transfusion immediately and contact the provider. Here we want to be prepared for emergency use epinephrine, as well as possibly giving them things like steroids or antihistamines. All right, the next reaction I want to talk about is going to be our febrile reaction, and this is going to be a result of the patient's immune reaction to the leukocytes in the donor blood. And then here, our signs and symptoms are going to be fever and chills. Usually this doesn't appear until about 60 to 90 minutes after you start giving the blood. But here again, stop the transfusion, contact the provider, and then here you want to be anticipating giving a antipyretic. Now we can also pre-medicate patients with the antipyretic to potentially help prevent this. All right, so the next reaction that I want to talk about is something that we refer to as TACO or transfusion-associated circulatory overload. So this is probably, as you can figure out, going to be the result of the patient being transfused too fast to be able to handle that increase in volume. Now, commonly, this is going to be an issue in our patients with heart failure or those that have a reduced ejection fraction. And in these cases, it may require running the blood as slow as possible over the entire four hours. And then diuretics such as Lasix can be given between units to help prevent this. Now, some signs and symptoms that our patient is dealing with this are going to be things like shortness of breath, tachypnea, hypoxia. Uh, you may auscultate uh, crackles in their lungs, uh, as well as they may have pulmonary edema. So here we're either going to need to stop or slow the infusion and then contact the provider. We want to be looking to administer oxygen for them if they're having issues with hypoxia, as well as being prepared to give them a diuretic. And now TACO is going to be less of a concern in our acutely bleeding patients as they're often going to be intravascularly depleted if you're needing to run blood in that fast. All right, and then the final complication that I want to talk about is going to be our trolley, our transfusion-related acute lung injury. And this is actually a very serious complication that can result from blood transfusion. Uh, it's actually the leading cause of death from transfusion-related complications. Now, the mechanisms for the cause of this are not well understood, but most cases are thought to be related to some sort of immune-mediated response from leukocyte antibodies. This reaction is going to be characterized by an acute onset of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema and hypoxia post-transfusion. So here, think sudden dyspnea, severe hypoxia, so SATs less than 90, hypotension, and fever. Although sometimes hypertension can also be seen. Now this typically is going to develop within six hours of transfusion, but we do see something that we call delayed trolley. This can actually occur six to 72 hours afterwards, and this one's actually associated with a higher mortality. And trolley is often impossible to distinguish from ARDS. The only real connecting thing here is that the patient just got a transfusion. Now, typically we associate this with plasma products, so FFP, platelets, etc. But this can result from PRBCs as well, because even though we do wash them out, there is still some plasma in there. And then our treatment here is really going to be supportive. So we want to do aggressive respiratory treatments with oxygen supplementation. Ultimately, this may require intubation for the patient. We want to use vasopressors for their hypotension. Steroids might also be helpful here. And then diuretics, unlike TACO, should be avoided in cases of trolley. All right, and so that was our review of blood types as well as some of the complications that come from the issues that come up from these different blood types and uh, some of the reactions that patients can get when getting these blood products. I really hope that you guys found this lesson useful. If you did and you liked it, please leave me a like down below. It really goes a long way to help support this channel, as well as sharing this lesson with other people you think might find it useful as well. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do so down below. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. I really appreciate the support that you guys continue to show this channel each and every month. For the rest of you guys, if you'd be interested in seeing how you could show support for this channel, you can either join the YouTube membership down below or head over to the Patreon page and check out some of the additional perks that you guys get for doing just that. You can also support this channel by following some of the links that are down in the lesson description below. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson in this series. Otherwise, check out a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.